Yeah, hi, good afternoon. I'm Vijay Pandey. I'm a journal partner, Andrews and Horowitz, all the way just uh, down the way there. Um, and so, and I, I run our biofund there. Uh, so uh, I think we have about 15 minutes uh, with James. I want to give you, get you a chance to get to know him and the company. I mean, first off, uh, you know, what is Appeal? What do you guys do? Yeah, yeah. Um, so very high level, uh, what Appeal is and what we do is we use food to preserve food, uh, which sounds really simple. Uh, so our marketing team likes that. Um, but uh, as a scientist, uh, to, to dig a little deeper, uh, what we do is we take uneaten or discarded or unused plant material. Uh, things that are left behind on a farm uh, could be uh, grape pressings from a winery or affluent from a, t a soup making facility. We take that stuff, uh, we blend it up, and then from those blends, we extract subsets of very particular food molecules. We turn those into a powder so that they're lightweight, they're low cost for us to distribute. You could think of something like a sugar packet uh, for a small application or something that looks like a brick of flour for a bigger application. Uh, we ship it to where we'd like to use it, and then we reconstitute uh, that powder uh, in liquid form. Basically, we mix it back up with water, and then we dip fresh produce into that solution, and we allow it to dry. And when it dries, it leaves behind this imperceptibly thin barrier of plant material on the outside of the produce, and that thin barrier acts to physically slow down the things that cause produce to spoil, which are water evaporating out of the produce and oxygen getting into the produce. And so by doing that, we can dramatically extend the shelf life of most types of fruits and vegetables by a factor of about two to four times, uh, even without refrigeration. Yeah, so, I mean, that sounds useful, but I mean, don't we already have techniques like, you know, wax or something like that that people have used already for many years? I mean, how does this compare to that? Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good point. And, um, you know, it, it's funny because this is not a new idea. Um, you know, monks in the Middle Ages figured out that you could dip apples in beeswax and they would last throughout the winter. Uh, the funny thing is, though, is uh, that if you go to a grocer today and you buy an organic apple, uh, it's still dipped in beeswax. And so uh, we've made a, a heck of a lot of advances in the area of material science uh, over, over the course of the last 2,000 years. But those, um, those innovations uh, really uh, have not been applied um, to the area of, of post-harvest preservation of fresh produce. And so, um, you know, wax is, is one kind of technology, but the, the main technology that's out there, and this is the one that, you know, is responsible for, you know, the ability of, of, of us in the United States and other developed nations to enjoy year-round virtually fresh produce, is the cold chain. Um, and it is exactly what it sounds like. Um, you know, produce is picked in the field, uh, it's taken to a refrigeration facility as quickly as possible. Uh, the fruit is brought down to temperature, which is normally just a hair above freezing because you don't want to freeze the fruit. That'll ruin the texture. Um, and then by doing that, by reducing the temperature, uh, you're able to slow down the rate the fruit's breathing. Most people don't think about fruit as still being alive once it's picked, but it's, it's very much still alive. The cells don't know they've been disconnected from the tree. And so you cool down the temperature, you reduce the rate of respiration, and by reducing the rate that the fruit is respiring, uh, you get an overall improvement in the shelf life of the produce. And that's, that's a fantastic trick um, if you've got the infrastructure necessary um, to maintain that, that cold chain, because you can't break it, right? You can't just get it cold and then let it warm back up. Uh, it has to stay cool throughout the entire chain. And so in places where there's the infrastructure to do so, that's great. Um, but that really only works to the point it gets to the store. Once it gets to the store, um, you know, consumers aren't going into a, you know, a cold chamber in the back of the store you know, with a parka on and picking out their strawberries. They're sitting right at the front of the store. And so you really lose the benefit of that cold chain uh, once you get to the retail and ultimately consumer level. And that's where the, the most devastating losses are in the food chain right now. Yeah, so your PhD is in material science. I mean, this seems pretty far from that. I mean, how'd you, how'd you come up with this idea? Yeah, no, it, it's, it, is, it is kind of funny. Um, you know, it's, it's really funny because I, I tell this story sometimes, but, you know, when I first had the idea for the company, I called my mom and told her, hey, mom, I've got this idea. And she said, you know, sweetie, that sounds really nice, but you don't know anything about fresh produce. And I was like, well, mom, you're right. That's not what I need to hear right now, but you're 100% correct. Um, I, I was, uh, so the, the inception of the company was um, actually on a trip between Santa Barbara and uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, where I was doing my PhD work and we were studying these flexible plastic solar panels. Uh, the idea was that you could mix up a solar paint, you could pour it on a table, let it dry, plug some electrodes into it and 
charge your phone or something, and I thought, wow, what a cool technology to, to be able to, to be involved with. I'd like to study that. And, um, but I, I went to school, and, and I was studying um, this effect where if you took the paint and you poured it on a table, and then you dry, you took the same paint, you poured it on the table, and you let it dry, but this one you covered up, and so it dried more slowly. Um, nothing had changed in the paint, just the one that dried more slowly had twice the efficiency of the one that, that dried more quickly. And so I spent you know, six and a half years of my life trying to understand why this one was better than this one if nothing had changed in terms of what went into it. Um, and so in order to make this you know, watching of the paint dry interesting, you have to be able to look at it at a, at a you know, more, more microscopic level. And so prepare samples in Santa Barbara and then drive them up to Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to use a synchrotron to look at them and figure out what was going on. And on one of these trips, you know, I was listening to podcasts and heard one about, you know, how we're going to feed 9 billion people. And it, it's kind of cliche, um, okay, there's world hunger, but, you know, what am I going to do about it? And, um, but I just happened to be driving through the Salinas Valley, and I didn't know it was Salinas Valley at the time. I just saw these lush green fields all over the place and thought to myself, you know, how is it that there are people on the planet going hungry or not eating when we've got these magical seeds, you can throw them into the ground, they absorb water, they absorb sunlight, they produce food, and oh, by the way, they self-propagate. How is it that we're screwing this up so badly that people are going hungry? So I looked into it, and it turned out that we really, the production side was not a big problem. Um, it was that all fresh produce was seasonal and perishable. Uh, which meant that it was effectively either feast or famine. You were either in season and you had a huge supply spike of produce available to you, or you were out of season and you had nothing available. And so the question became, well, okay, so people aren't going hungry not because we can't grow food. People are going hungry because we can't store food once it's produced. And so you know, kind of being naturally curious, well, the next kind of obvious question is, well, okay, well, if produce is spoiling, what causes it to spoil? And if you look into it, and you know, a quick Google search will turn up that the leading causes of produce spoilage are water loss and oxidation, which is water evaporating out of the produce and oxygen getting in. Um, so that, that rang a bell as soon as I learned that um, from my undergraduate studies at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. And um, at Carnegie Mellon, Carnegie Mellon, as a uh, material scientist, we studied steel, uh, lots of it. You know, Andrew Carnegie, steel guy, uh, Pittsburgh steel town. And, the way you make steel is you combine iron and carbon atoms together in a very particular ratio. If you get that ratio correct, you get a high strength, lightweight, low cost building material, which is you know, responsible for the, the hotel that we're sitting in right now. Um, the problem is, is that those iron atoms inside that chunk of iron and, and carbon really like to react with oxygen in the atmosphere. And when they react with oxygen in the atmosphere, they form iron oxide or rust, and it continues to eat through that, that chunk of iron. And so it limits the utility of the things that you can use this for. So, so metallurgists figured out this really clever trick that if you incorporated a small number of sacrificial atoms into that chunk of iron, things like molybdenum, chromium, nickel, et cetera, those atoms, instead of the iron, would diffuse to the surface and react with oxygen in the atmosphere to form this thin oxide barrier around the outside of the steel. And that barrier would then physically occlude further oxygen from reaching that surface, and hence we got the, the term stainless steel. And so the connection you know, kind of became, well, okay, if people are going hungry because of perishability, and perishability is caused by water loss and oxidation, and we had steel, which was perishable, and that problem was solved by creating a thin barrier around the outside of the produce, could we solve the perishability problem and hence address the hunger problem by creating a thin barrier on the outside of the produce? And that was the, the kind of the genesis, and I got excited about this, and I went back to Santa Barbara, and I told my, told my friends, I was at UCSB, and I uh, said, hey, I've got this idea. They said, you know, sounds like a cool idea, bro, but nobody wants to eat chemicals. I'm like, ah, UCSB. Um, then it was kind of funny because well, it's like, well, yeah, but water's a chemical. I mean, air is a chemical. Food's a chemical. Well, wait a minute. If, if people philosophically have assigned food to not being a chemical, perhaps we could restrict ourselves to only using those materials that are found in food to create these barriers. And in so doing, we'd be using food to preserve food. And philosophically, how, you, how could you kind of argue with that? So that was really the, the, the genesis and kind of you know, how, how this whole thing got started. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge goal. I mean, what are the first steps? I mean, how do you first get into market with something, something like that? Yeah, the, it's, it's so fascinating to learn about uh, the food supply chain today. And, and my mom was right. I knew nothing about this uh, when, when we got started. Um, 
it comes down to so so uh, you know I remember actually uh, you know one of our first meetings uh, you know presenting kind of talking about the technology and I remember uh, Mark Andreessen asked so so who pays for it and it's the right question because the food supply chain is is uh, so segregated in the sense that you've got a bunch of disaggregated growers you've got uh, packing facilities which source that produce from all those different growers uh, they they match the packing specification size grade color, put it in the right boxes, and then they're responsible for getting it to a, a retailer or an importer, and then that retailer or importer then sells it to a consumer that goes, goes to their home. But at each point in the chain, there, no one owns the produce all the way through that chain. So the produce is harvested effectively in, in generally an area where the production costs are low, um, and then it's being imported, and then as soon as the fruit is received, uh, the the grower uh, is the, the fruit is checked basically by the retailer say okay it's an acceptable quality I've gotten it and then the grower gets paid and so if anything happens to it after that it spoils that's the problem of the retailer um, and so the there's not a lot of incentive to get a high quality piece of produce beyond just getting it to the door of the retailer and so what we've found is that uh, with our technology, we, c we, we can actually approach growers with a technology which is an alternative to the modes of transportation that they're using today because we can offer them a cost savings relative to those existing technologies, which, but then on top of that, offer benefits to their retail customer as an advantage of, per of sourcing produce from them relative to a competitor. And so the way that we've had to get started has been not to go to the retailers and have them say, request this from all their suppliers, but to go work directly with the suppliers themselves, demonstrate the benefit to them in terms of a hot, hard dollar cost savings to get that flywheel spinning so that we can start getting longer lasting produce into the retail stores until that becomes the norm. You know, and one other question is that, uh, you know, so I could see how this helps get existing products, but how does it change, you know, the possibilities for what other, or other things we have? So much of what we eat is what we can ship. I mean, how, do, how does it change our lives? Yeah, absolutely. No, I love, I love this idea, and this is probably the thing that gets me most excited um, about, about what it is that we're doing. And the, the reason is largely that uh, produce, um, because of this perishability that we were talking about uh, recently, uh, has effectively a, a, a radius around which uh, it can be distributed, right? If you think about production regions being distributed around the world for different kinds of produce, um, and you know where the produce can be grown at what time of the year, um, and you know how long that produce can last, and you know how fast a boat can move or a plane can fly, you can kind of draw rings around where, that season, where the seasonal availability is of that produce throughout the year. And so if you take that and you use our product to extend the shelf life of that piece of produce, you effectively grow the radius with which you're able to distribute that product to customers. So you're relaxing this idea of seasonality uh, to the produce. And uh, what's so cool about this is that, you know, if you look at w the types of produce that are huge commercial successes today, uh, the reason that they're so successful is largely because they are bred for, the number one thing they're bred for is transportability, uh, perhaps not surprising. You generally have to concentrate the production in one region where the climate is optimal for that production, but then you need to distribute, uh, in order to solve this you know, spike in supply, you need to be able to distribute widely geographically. And so what we found is that in working with small growers, particularly we're working with organic growers, um, who have perhaps done their own breeding program to come up with a strawberry that is absolutely delicious, but only has three or four days of shelf life, by giving them our product, we are able to uh, relax the transportability constraint of that piece of produce so that now they can have their own commercially viable product uh, which at the, now they can create commercial viability basically for their produce, which otherwise would have had too narrow of a distribution window. Yeah, so I think we have 20 seconds left, so I'll ask you an easy question. So how does this cure world hunger? <laughs> uh, well, we hope it's one step in the right direction. Uh, you certainly need a systems approach to doing so, but um, they, it looks like they've queued up here some, some of the videos. Um, and, and this is a great demonstration basically of, of the power of the technology. And so you can see in one situation we have untreated produce and then on the, uh, the right side we have treated pro product. 
And these are all run at ambient conditions. And the mangoes that you see here, this is actually run at ambient conditions in Nairobi, Kenya, where we actually have a time-lapse system and product deployed there. We're able to give an extra seven to 10 days of shelf life to a mango, even without refrigeration. And, and to Vijay, to answer your question, the key here is in places of the world that do not have the underlying infrastructure necessary to maintain the cold supply chain, our product is an alternative for those produce suppliers to be able to apply a product which gives them some of the benefit of refrigeration without needing to rely on that government uh, to, to provide that. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much.